On this episode of the Changeover Podcast, we have Dustin Tankersley. He's a world-class racket stringer and customizer and a head of the Luxalon string team at the Grand Slams. He's strung for some of the greatest tennis players of all time, including Rafael Nadal, and today he takes us through the ins and outs of racket customization. Let's get into it. Okay, Dustin, so for those people who don't know the concept of racket customization, can you give the audience a breakdown of exactly what that entails and what your, I guess, job description in the industry would be for, for players? Yeah, uh, so racket customization, um, most people don't realize this, but when you buy three or four rackets off the shelf, they're slightly different. And when you deal with pro players, consistency is the biggest part of the game so having their equipment being consistent is vital um, so basically what what that entails is adding weight in different areas to make the rackets the same and then also from there uh, a lot of pros like certain specs so it's making all the rackets that spec or even what i enjoy doing is working with players where we're trying different setups and, and trying to find the ideal setup for that player okay and how would you go about like you buy a racket off the shelf for those for those who have no idea how it works you get the racket off the shelf how how could you manipulate a racket to change the weights and change how i guess the racket off the shelf would perform yeah so if you add weight to the tip of the racket it changes the way the racket feels probably more than anything because it just takes a little bit of weight to add a lot of swing weight at the tip if you add weight on the sides it makes it more stable um, it doesn't really affect the swing weight as much, but it does affect swing weight. And then anything below your hand, you really don't feel at, on the swing weight at all. It's more, uh, just adding weight. Uh, so, so basically you can adjust the specs to, to fit that player's game a little bit more, or, um, you know, if they have multiple rackets, a lot of times players just want to match up so they're the same. So, or if they have a racket they like better than the others, Hopefully it's a heavier one, and then I can make all the other ones just like that mm. one. But sometimes it's not, and you got to throw rackets away. And <laughs> I guess it's easier to add weight. It's not as it's not as easy to take. Yeah, it's, weight it's away. It's almost impossible. Other than like shaving down the head guard or something, it's okay. almost impossible to remove weight from the head of the racket. Okay. Can you explain the concept of the balance point? I know they yeah. play like like the racket. Let's say head light or head heavy. Like how does I guess we have different elements of a yeah. of like customization. So you have like the weight, and yeah. then you have the swing weight. You yeah. have the balance point. So like yeah. I guess you if you can break down like the different ones. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So so static weight is the overall weight of the racket. So if you have you know ten grams in the tip of the racket and ten grams in the handle of the racket, um, or let's say you added weight, you added ten grams to the tip. 10 grams to the, to the bottom, it doesn't affect the balance. The balance is going to stay the same. Mm-hmm. Um, if you go weight jump towards the tip, it increases the swing weight as far as uh, makes the racket more head heavy. Um, and if you go in the handle, it makes the more racket more head light. Uh, what's interesting is a lot of people don't realize like the, the really light rackets are head heavy and they have to make them head heavy to make the racket feel good at all. Like if you have an eight ounce racket and it's, you know, if it's evenly balanced or head light, it would be the worst racket you could ever play with. I didn't even know that. Okay. Yeah. So like those super light rackets <laughs> yeah. that you see, like some of these old ladies playing with, some of them have a really high swing weight because they have to have all the weights got to be in the head for it to feel good. Okay. Because um, if it's on the handle and you hit it, it's just going to feel hollow and, and terrible. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So how does the, I guess, so head size, string pattern stiffness of the racket all yeah. these things change how the racket plays right so oh, can yeah. you i guess give a breakdown into these different elements of of like i guess the racket yeah so head size the bigger the head size the more power in general um the smaller the head size the more control in general um and it's again all everything is like you have so many factors involved in every racket that it's hard to say like this one thing is going to change it completely but in general, a bigger head size is going to give you more power. A smaller head size is going to give you more control. Um, if you have a tighter pattern, like an 18 by 20, you're going to get more control out of that. Uh, more open pattern, like a 16, 19, you're going to get a little bit more spin. 
uh, and the ball's going to come off the strings a little bit quicker. Um, and then what else was it? The I guess also we can include grip size, right? Yeah, that's that's an interesting too because a lot of players now and now, I mean, more and more the trend is going with smaller grip sizes. But um, when I strung for Alcaraz at Labor Cup, he's playing four and a half, okay. which I would have never guessed. He was playing a four and a half grip size. Which is big. He yeah, grip, he grip around pretty easy. Yeah, still. yeah, and and the reason guys are going with smaller grip sizes is so they can whip the racket head through more, and they feel like they get a little bit more on the ball. But then you're also, I think, there's an increase in wrist injuries because they're trying to do so much with it that, um, I think it contributes a little bit. And then, you know, in general, like when we talk about everything in general, right? You want the grip size to be the ideal grip size. If it's too small you're gripping too tight to keep it from twisting, or if it's too big, you're having to grip it too tight to keep it from twisting. Mm -hmm. So you kind of want to find the, the grip size that's comfortable to swing without having to grip the racket tight. Um, and then I think also the, the smaller it is, the more chance of wrist injuries. I think a bigger grip size is going to be less stress on your arm, your wrist, and everything else. Yo, one year, Wilson sent me by mistake. Oh, I don't know if they sent me by mistake, but... I thought maybe I ordered like the four and a half and my wrists were done. Like <laughs> I, it took me a long time to get used to the bigger grip size. Like it was such a huge difference than four and three eights. It's crazy how the smallest difference, something in your hand like that, whether it's like weight a little bit further up or the grip being slightly bigger can affect how your whole body reacts. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can get hurt so easy. Like I was playing yeah. for the last maybe two years before I switched rackets with a four and a quarter and Leather grip as well. So it's kind yeah. of hard. Yeah. And um, as you play with leather grips and you sweat, they shrink. So I feel like I got even probably smaller than the four and a quarter that I started with. Yeah. And I was probably squeezing a lot and I actually ended up having like a hand issue. Yeah. And um, when I switched rackets and I went to the soft over grip, I don't recall it, the regular replacement oh, grip. I think they call it authentic. Yeah. Like, yeah, cushion grip. Cushion grip, whatever. Yeah. And yeah. four and three quarters, the pain actually went away within a few weeks. So. I think it's actually important that you figure out what the appropriate hand size is, the hand, the grip size, because you can be hurting yourself with, like, for no reason. Yeah. See so yeah, if you can put the mic a little bit closer to you. Sorry. And the the grips compress over time as well. You know that's why a lot of pro players will use leather grips because they don't compress as much as the cushion grips. Mm. And then some guys are actually switching them out like every three or four months because yeah. they do get smaller. Um, over time also it does i have a theory about the pro staffs the the wilson pro staff that i use yeah. and i guess it's a theory for all rackets but i really noticed it with the pro staff when i first used the pro staff i felt like it was very stiff racket yeah. and then over time it gets because i guess i noticed it because in preseason when i was switching to the pro staff i was using a used racket so i got used to the feeling of yeah. how to use one and i said okay i'm switching to this racket and i got all the new ones yeah. and i was fencing balls so yeah I felt like the racket over time gets more flexible. Is that accurate every or am racket, I crazy? Yeah, every racket does. Okay. And that's typically like the top pros are switching rackets every three or four months because of that. Um, I think Delpo was like a huge example of why you don't want to play with a racket for more than a couple of years because he got all his new rackets and uh, he didn't like any of them. Like he couldn't switch because he, he didn't like the cosmetic the one year. They had a new cosmetic. Yeah, yeah. The black and, and yellow one. Yeah. Right? And yeah. then I think they even made one like the Argentina flag colors, like mm -hmm. the next round. Mm -hmm. And he didn't like that one either. So he played with the same like three rackets. The for, red like, and three black years. and white one. Yeah. And even at the end. Is that like, the 6195? Mm -hmm. Is that what that is? Yeah. And I know towards the end of his career, like we were stringing his racket every day just to string it to try to get it to soften up a little bit because he didn't like them. I mean, he was talking about going and getting them off the shelf, and no you know, the guy at Wilson was like, "It's not the same racket. You, you know, <laughs> you can't go to eBay and get this racket. It's yeah. not the same." So, um, yeah, they they do get soft over time. Uh, for most players, like recreational players, it's probably three or four years before it starts going dead, essentially. Yeah. Uh, but for pro players, you're stringing the racket so much, you're hitting the ball so hard, it's probably more like three or four months. Okay. Um, what about the beam thickness? How does that affect how the racket plays? Because I know some yeah. rackets are thinner and some are fatter. Yeah, yeah, and that kind of goes to the stiffness as well, which we didn't really talk about a second ago when you asked. But uh, a stiffer Sorry, racket is going to give you more player. <laughs> uh, a stiffer racket is going to give you more power, and mm -hmm. so typically the thicker the racket is, the stiffer it is okay. in general. Um, so yeah, it's going to give you more power as well. Thinner beams, more control. Thicker beams, more power. But it's 
it's essentially tied to the stiffness. You okay. can't make a really thick frame and make it flexible. flexible. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you can, but it's, it's harder to do because you have more graphite you're dealing with. Okay. Yeah. And going back really quick to a swing weight and the, the conversation with swing weight. So if there's more weight in the head of the racket, yeah. the swing weight is going to be more right yeah it's going to make the racket feel heavier i guess when you swing that's the definition yeah. and yeah the way you feel when you swing the racket is essentially what swing weight yeah is. and then that is correlation to the balance point yeah yeah so it you know if, like, again going back to like the 10 grams like if you had 10 grams in the handle you're you're changing the swing weight um well you're not really changing the swing weight at all with 10 grams in the handle if you add that same gra 10 grams to the tip of the racket it's super head heavy so it's going to have a really high swing weight. If you put it at the throat in the middle, it's going to increase the overall weight, but it's not going to affect the swing weight as much. Yeah. So depending on where you add weight, it affects the balance point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And if, let's say we have a player that's watching this podcast that has never customized a racket in their yeah. life, it's their first time, is there any advice that you can give them or any direction you can give them besides going to Mosey Tennis and, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and getting involved? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, like the thing that you have to be careful with when you're adding weight to your own racket is you don't know what the specs are to begin with. So um, it's like I was working with a player the other day where she gave me th three rackets, actually four rackets. One of them I'd add weight, weight to on court. And she was like, you know, I like the one without the weight better. And so I took that one and it was just as high a swing weight as the other one. Mm -hmm. um, it was, or it was very close. It was just like two points less where all the other ones are like in the 280 swing weight range where these were both over 290, which isn't crazy high, but it kind of gives you an example of you got to have to know really what you're starting with. Okay. So generally at, at the beginning, I think it's easy to add silicone in the handle. You just got to be careful that, you know, you put some cotton balls in there to, so the silicone just doesn't run all the way through the frame, but silicone in the handle will give you a little bit more power, a little bit more stability, uh, absorb shock and vibration a little bit better, but adding weight to the head, you got to be careful that you don't add too much. Just like Justin was saying, if you add a little bit here and a little bit there, you know, you can change things dramatically and, you got to be careful Elbow, with that. shoulder, wrist, everything. Yeah. You see why I hit, yeah. see why I hit the ball so bad? I have silicone in the handle, bro. That's why I'm hitting the forehand. Huge. <laughs> with the backhand. <laughs> that too. Need more silicone, I guess. <laughs> um, and then, what about the placement of the lead? So, I guess how people put weight in the head of the racket is with lead tape. Yeah. That's, if you guys have watch tennis on TV and you see on the side of the racket, I don't know, can you pass my racket, Justin, if you can reach it, but there's like strips of silver lead on the side of the racket. I guess we can we can edit it in, but like I have mine here on the side. These were done by Dustin and then probably some on the inside of the, the head guard. So can you talk to the audience about the reasoning? Like what's the difference between putting lead at the the side or at the top or maybe some in the throat of the rackets like yeah besides the obvious just swing weight and 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 that sort of stuff yeah yeah so the weight on the sides at three and nine there will give you more stability like especially on off center hits um that's these ones yeah yeah and then you know weight at the tip of the racket is gonna give you it's gonna increase the swing weight it's gonna help you you know maybe if you're more of a loopy player um, so it just kind of depends on the playing style a little bit too, where you, a lot of times on the tour, you don't see lead because it's all under the head guard. So it just depends on what that player likes. Um, and I think some put the weight there because they, it feels better and some just don't want to see the, the, the lead yeah. or they don't want the lead to fall off. So they just make sure they want it all where they can't see it. Um, but yeah, it, it just depends. Every player is a little bit different and you know, where you add the weight can affect the way the ball comes off the racket and you know, your swing path does, you know, matter for that as well. Like okay. players that are loopy or, or generally have a little bit different spec than players that drive the ball and hit flat balls. Okay. And yeah. can you see that from the weights of like the pros, like you strung at grand slams and like huge events. So yeah. can you, do you get a chance to like take notes of some of the player specs and that sort of stuff? Or is that yeah, kind of frowned upon? Sometimes, um, you know, like we've got a machine there typically to measure swing weight. And sometimes I'll check specs of a player's racket just, just to see what it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, typically, you know, like, um, 
you know, someone like Medvedev, who's so like whippy. And I mean, he has a light, uh, has, he's got weight in his racket, but it's got a low swing weight because he wants to be able to swing the racket head faster. And he's like Gumby out there, right? Mm -hmm. Like he's, <laughs> he's doing stuff that no one else is doing. Yeah, yeah. But then you have like someone like Djokovic who drives the ball almost every time. You know, and he has weight on the sides and, you know, that's a, a completely different setup. So if you switch rackets with those guys, they wouldn't know what to do, really. Mm -hmm. um, so it just depends on the player, uh, what, you know, what they like, what they've tried. And a lot of times, you know, I think some of them are working with people that are really knowledgeable. And then some of them are just going by whatever the coach says. And a lot of coaches are really good at coaching tennis, but don't know much about this side of the game at okay. all, um, which so is interesting. So for, for the people, for the first time, if you're customizing your number one, I guess, piece of advice would be to try and see if you can figure out what your specs are before you do anything to the racket, like however possible. Yeah, I mean, I think that if, if you add 10 grams of silicone in the handle, it's not going to change the, rack, the way the racket swings or feels. Um, it, it will change the way it feels, but it's not going to change the way it swings. So it's not as noticeable. Um, it's just going to help give you a little bit more on the ball and help absorb shock vibration a little bit. I think that's the easiest thing to do. And then whatever you, if you add weight to the sides or the tip of the racket, I would just go start in small increments Good. to where you're, you're, you're not going crazy with a super heavy racket yeah. and tearing up your shoulder in one practice. You <laughs> Been <know>? there. Yeah. <laughs> Been there. All right. Uh, should we run a game, Justin? Or I guess over under, you have some of the over under questions. All right. So there are these people who string the main string yeah. And a different tension to the cross string. Yeah. Is there an, a real effect there? Is that like a a real thing? Or is it just whatever the difference is where the racket is at? Probably. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Some players will do tighter mains, looser crosses. Mm -hmm. um, like Alcarez is like two kilos difference. So he goes two kilos lower really? than the cross. Which to me, I don't think it's a huge difference. But I think it does have a different feel as far as I think it's going to allow the main strings to slide a little bit more because the crosses are looser. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in theory, you should be able to get a little bit more spin. Okay. I don't know. And, you know, I haven't experimented myself to try it myself to see if I can feel a difference. Um, and then there's other players that will string the, the crosses tighter. Mm -hmm. And I think the theory there is you keep the mains from moving as much because the crosses are tighter. So I, I don't think either one of them is a huge difference. I think like, Guys like you can probably feel the difference. Mm -hmm. Guys on the tour can feel the difference and say, okay, yeah, I can feel that. And if it's, maybe it's better, maybe it's not. But I think the average recreational player, I mean, a lot of them can't feel the difference between five pounds, you yeah. know? And, and I think they've done like a uh, play test before in the past where if you can't hear the sound of the strings, like they, if you, you can't hear it at all, you can't tell the difference between like five or 10 pounds. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting because it's, we rely on how it sounds when you make contact really, with the ball. Really, that affects how it feels to us. Yeah. Yeah, that affects how much you feel like the, the tension and everything else. Mm. Yeah. Because so that's, a racket would feel different on a, on a grass court? If I'd imagine like... So could that be a reason like so someone's playing on Arthur Ashe for the first time yeah. and it's, it's loud yeah. and they're nervous and whatever and they start playing and the ball's flying. Yeah. Is it, that could be, have something to do with the sound, the spatial awareness. I mean, it could a little bit. I think it's more of like they can't really feel like mm. the difference between like a two pounds difference there. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, and I think we rely so much on, you know, the, the ping noise uh -huh. of whether this racket's tighter or this racket's looser. Yeah. You know, like if sure. you were, if you were took like five rackets and I they did, were I all did it like, today. Yeah. What? Ding, 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 yeah. to see which I one. do it all the time. Yeah. I do it all the time to hear whichever one sounds the highest pitch is the title yeah. one. Yeah, and you know it's crazy. I've had guys at tournaments where they've dropped a racket off to get strong, come to pick it up and go, "Nah, it's too tight. Go down two pounds." Never even hit a ball with it. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, no. yeah, and then come back after dropping two pounds. He's like, "Oh, that's perfect." <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I always switch to because I think maybe like. I'm strong in my right hand, so when I hit this one, yeah, you have to yeah. and then maybe switch. I go yeah, like yeah, this, you know, yeah. so I go like ding, 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 and then I switch, and I go ding, ding, ding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I have to do it. I have to do it by hand because I always like I feel like I hit it one a little bit harder than yeah. the other. But if I do this, I'm like, okay, I can. how good are you? You're a at, specialist. You're supposed to just swing and just. How good are you at doing this with the racket and knowing around what tension it is? 
No, not no good. good? No. <laughs> no? I, I can tell you like which one's tighter. I but can you can't say what I the tension is. I can tell you is. if one was like a pound tighter or looser, but I can't tell you what tension it is. Okay. No. How many rackets do you think you've strung in your life? Oh, uh, I have no idea. You know, it's interesting. We were, I was stringing in Australia one year and we're all stringing. And there was a guy actually from, from Dallas who posted he had strung his 50,000th racket or something like that. And we're all standing around going, I don't. How do you know? Yeah, how like, do you count that? Like, how, how do you know? And, Get a and, life, and we're dog. all like, oh, yeah. <laughs> he has string, a life. String a racket. String a racket. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then one of the guys with us, he goes, I've done over 100,000 rackets. And we're like, no. cap, 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 cap. He's lying. Like, He's lying. How do you but, know that? But he, okay. How, so, question. He's lying. How many? No, 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 no we can worked, figure this out. He worked at Hollaberg for 20 years. 100,000 rackets. And he got paid. Per racket. And he his hands doing, his hands haven't fallen off yet? No, well, no, these guys string with things on. You never <laughs> see them uh, the things? The wow. tape around no, the fingers? Man, no. <laughs> Those are the no, amateurs. He, You've never been to Cancun? You've never seen the oh, stringers no. in Cancun no. Tennis Academy? No. <laughs> are they really doing it? They have stuff on their fingers? Yeah, it depends on if yeah, you go like, some of the countries, they, they yeah, they, they wrap the fingers. Wow. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, no, I've never never we have one guy that's from like Hong Kong that he'll tape his fingers. Yeah. And stuff like that. He was wearing gloves a little bit at one point, but He's the only one I know. Okay. Yeah. But you guys, I was gonna say, at the slams, you guys track how many rackets. Like the so for how how big is a string team at a slam? So right now at the the US Open, we had twenty two. At the French, I think we had twenty one stringers. Okay. So um last this year we didn't hit seven thousand rackets at the open, but last year we did over seven thousand rackets. Okay. And would do you keep track per person as well? We kind of, but not not like you know, not like they're not getting paid by the racket. So if I was getting paid by the racket, yeah, I would want to know keep, exactly yeah. how many I did. I would keep track of it. Like when I do smaller events, I'll use like two paper or um, carbon pit prints where I have one slip that the, the string will get. Okay. So we know how at the end of the day, we know they did 20 rackets or whatever it is. And they can keep track of that so I can pay them per racket. But at the slams, we're getting paid by the day. So um we don't really care we yeah. you know it's more about just getting everything done and getting the team out of there yeah. yeah and then when players come at the slams to drop rackets off would they stay with the same stringer like if if yeah. alcaraz came to you and you strung alcaraz does he stay with you or do you guys arrange that or like, yeah so that we look that's one of my jobs is like i, I kind of manage the team now where i'm not stringing as much um so i oversee the operation i make sure that you know i assign someone like Alcaraz to a, which he's private service now. So one of the, his private service stringers actually in the room with us at the slams that we do. Um, but yeah, I would assign him to a stringer that I know is going to be there all the way to the end. Okay. So that way we don't have to worry uh, about okay. it. Like the players, the top players, that's what we do. We, we make sure we've got three or four guys at the end and I, they get the bulk of the top players because I don't want to have to worry about, uh, this one feels looser because we switched the machine, your stringer left. Um, which a lot of the stuff we do, is geared towards making sure that the player would never feel the difference. Mm -hmm. We calibrate the machines. Everyone's trained to have the same techniques. We tie off in the same spots. The knot length is the same. Like everything is. Yo, I need to learn how to tie it off, bro. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when I string, the record looks quick. quick the side, <laughs> this string at the side is always, you can just wobble it. And the bottom, the bottom one too. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, for me, it's the top one, it's the side one. Speaking you know? of yeah. top, but I was going to say, uh, I also have a private service string, and it's right there. It's yeah, string is <laughs> code changeover, $100 of a, of a machine. <laughs> um, speaking of stringing for top players, you know how when you got a big match, like, you might, you might not be able to eat as much before, like, you might be a little nervous. Like, is, I, I, has there ever been a player that gave you rackets, and you were, like, a little tight to string the racket? Um... Not not really anymore. I think like, you know, like the first time you string for someone like Nadal, I mean, I think that was like, he was probably the first really big player that I strung for at the US Open. And it was like, we had a guy that was, that trained everyone. And this guy trained like Roman Proke. So he's like a legend in the industry, which, you know, a lot of people don't know him because he's- Who's he Roman Proke? Roman Prokes? You don't know who Roman is? Okay, so Roman was... <laughs> you don't know Roman. Am I supposed to know who Roman, who so Roman is? Yeah. I don't know who Roman so is either. He's on the cool. level of, of Bosworth, right? Okay, so okay. He was Ags, he's personal stringer. Okay. He was... Uh, he's like your Federer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Him and Bosworth are probably the two biggest names okay. as far as customizing. And, okay. Um, but yeah, he was Ags, he's personal stringer. He was um customized for he still customized for a lot of players but anyway yeah is he the p1 guy yeah oh, okay. oh no, no no that's that's nate oh okay sorry so, yeah. nate. so rp and, nate. so 
So Roman <laughs> is R P and Y. Okay. And then uh, ah, okay. And then Nate Ferguson is is P one. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, you're so, saying ah like you know. What no, that because is. Joey sent his records to R P and Y. Sorry. Yeah. Shut up. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so that's yeah. Those are two of the you know three I guess were the biggest ones. Okay. Um. But anyway, this guy trained him and he was out for a couple days because he was uh he was local there so he was out so i i strung for nadal while he was out for a couple days he had a wedding to go to or something uh -huh. so um i was think you know back then that was probably one of the first and i started stringing us open in 2009 so that was probably like 2011 2012 when okay. i was still really new into to doing tournament stringing um but at this point i mean not really anymore like mm. i think it's I kind of equate like stringing it at a, at a slam is kind of like playing in a match uh -huh. at a like in a, in a venue like a slam, you know, like a big venue because it's there's not a lot more pressure, but there's a little bit more pressure. Mm -hmm. And you just want to make sure you're you're kind of hyper focused to make sure you don't make a mistake. Yeah, the, the, um, the stakes are higher. Yeah. Ooh. Whereas if you're, you know, playing a practice match with, you know, Jody out there, it's like the you want to win me stringing for you guys. You know, it's like it's it's yeah. not. It's not as much pressure, so there is a little bit of that. Do you, do you ever like make a mistake? Everyone makes mistakes, but I mean like a bad one, where like he came in and it was like somebody was pissed. Uh, well, oh, no, really. I mean, I that's the thing I get to be when you know I took over as kind of the team captain slash manager. Now is I get to deal with all those issues. Okay. Like you, you say, know, like it's a good thing. Well, <laughs> I get the privilege of dealing with these issues. You know, he, he didn't mess up, so it's just like it's like I'm sorry, but yeah. this guy's I mean, new. You know, there's there's some of Justin those is new. He's, calling, he's throwing him on the bus. Justin is our new string. See him over there, yeah. red, red hat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so i mean yeah, there's there's i mean yeah we've all made mistakes like mm. and the goal is if something happens we try to fix it before uh the stringer knows but you know there's always you know some things that are kind of out of control like the player drops off a little bit later or and then we have trouble getting them done and i think the biggest issue we have now is you know we have multiple spaces at at the u.s open so it's me knowing what's going on in the other room is is difficult because we don't have enough room and the space we're in. Mm -hmm. So hopefully at some point. You mean point, there's two swing, string rooms? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we Are have, they nearby? Huh? Are they close to each other? Uh, Wilson store and then and then Ash. So one is okay. Louis Armstrong, so in two separate okay, okay. stadiums. Uh, so that's a little bit of an issue, but you know it's it's hard to manage another room when you can't see what's going on over there. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, like I, I remember at one point, like a player dropped off two rackets one night. And I'd already left for the night. And the next day she comes in and she's like, they completely feel different. And she and hands them to me and I'm like, yeah, they're different. I'm sorry, we'll redo them right now. It turns out the two guys that were closing that night, instead of one of them doing both the rackets, they just said, you do one, I'll do one, we'll be done with it. And, you know, it's it would have taken one of them probably 35, 40 minutes at the most to do both of them. Yeah. And they wanted to be done in 15 minutes. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But then that's the thing. I have to go to the stringers and go like, look. How harsh for you? I have to deal with this. Please don't do it again. Like it's please. You didn't yeah. say it that nicely. Um. Yeah, I did actually. I think. I mean, <laughs> it was you know more of at the beginning, but then I'm like, come on, really? Like yeah. that's. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I get the player drops off ten rackets at eight o'clock at night. Okay, you don't want to be here till one in the morning stringing the eight rackets or ten rackets, whatever it is. But two rackets, that's pretty easy. What's mm -hmm. the most amount of rackets someone dropped off? Serena used to do 10 all the time. And then she would do, like, sometimes even right before the match, do two more. Like, so she's walking on the court sometimes with 12 rackets. Like, that's going to be Justin when he switched to this racket. Justin breaks yeah. strings like and in breaks strings 30 well, minutes. That's the problem with the 16, 19. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that's the other thing we didn't talk about is the 18, 20 will last a little, a little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah. And it depends on, like, the flatter your ball is, the, the longer they last. If you hit with a lot of spin, they're going to break quicker. But, a 16-19 is definitely going to break quicker than yeah, so fast. But that was the next question you had about same-day stringing. So right? I heard these oh, stories yeah. that Novak likes his racket strong on the day of the match. Is that an overrated or underrated thing? Like, does it affect the performance of the racket that much if I string a racket today and play with it tomorrow than if I did it Be careful hour, you answer hour, 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 hour I play, yeah. He'll yeah. do this. Yeah. He'll go and no, drop his right. rackets off two hours before he plays. You know, he's <laughs> dropping off eight rackets like Serena. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, some of the worst ones are the ones that want them right before they walk on the court. Yeah. And then they want, you know, they'll send ones right as soon as they go out there. Like, um, yeah. And I think 
if you string a racket like during a match, that's going to completely feel different because the strings really haven't had time to settle. Whereas, it's not like a I, stick. You cook a stick, let it sit. <laughs> <laughs> but I think once it sits for like four hours, because we've kind of done some experiments on it to see, mm. okay, does it really matter if we string it in the morning? versus stringing it at night. And I think if you go and you play with it within within that first like three or four hours, then yeah, it's gonna feel a little bit tighter, I think. But if you if it sits more than four hours, like and then there's a lot of players that want them strung the night before. Mm -hmm. And then they're the ones dropping off late and they want it strung at night. And you're like, okay, well <laughs> okay, now you dropped off eight rackets and I gotta have someone stay here until the end, right? Uh -huh. Um so those those are the hard parts. But I think I think once it sits for like four to six hours, it doesn't matter if it was strung the night before or the day of. But I think if, let's say you're first on and we string your racket, you're playing at 10 o'clock and we string it at eight o'clock, it's going to feel a little bit tighter than if we strung it the night before. Mm -hmm. What about if it sits for days? Like what if I, because it's happened before where I would string like, let's say four rackets yeah. and then... By the time I'm using the fourth one, I'm four or five days in, yeah. you know, or if Lucky I, you. Or, <laughs> or, or if I string one, I know travel Im impacts it, right? Yeah. Like you go on a plane, yeah. it's going to lose tension in the altitude, right? Hey, what's up guys? Sorry to interrupt the episode. If you're able to, it would mean a lot to us if you can subscribe to the channel. That's the best way to support us, help us to continue to make cool episodes with cool guests and really gives us the best chance to grow as a business. Thanks so much and enjoy the rest of the episode. What yeah, if you, if, I mean, it's, I think the plane, it's the hot and cold, like, because it gets really cold if it's in, um, in the plane okay. versus if you didn't carry it on, if you check the back. Yeah. Um, so I think that affects the temperature, the temp or affects the tension more. Makes it when, looser, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, anything that you have extreme heat or extreme cold, I don't think it's going to be good for your strings. Okay. But if I like string it, let's say I string it and leave it in this AC where it's just comfortable for yeah. five days. It's going to settle at some point. And then I think, you know, generally if it sits for another, I think there's, there's like two phases, right? It's going to have the first initial settle. And then as soon as you start playing with it, it's going to lose more tension. I think if you let it sit for, you know, three or four days, it may settle a little bit more, but I don't think it's going to, be much different okay. than, and I think it's, you know, but we have guys that will cut them out. Like they didn't use them, they're cutting them out. Like Serena, for instance, like she would have string 10 rackets, use three of them and we cut them all. Yeah, but that's ridiculous. Yeah. But Wilson yeah. is just tossing string at Serena like this, you know, yeah. more string. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take, <laughs> take more string. Oh, you want natural gut here? Here's all the natural gut. I, got, yeah. I actually got one more for you. Does oh. she use natural gut? She probably yeah. does, right? Yeah. Yeah, she was gut mains and then 4G cross. Well, she was, they were both all gut for years and years and years. When I first started stringing, they were both playing full gut. And then they switched to gut mains and then 4G cross. What is the different effect of having the gut in mains versus having it in a cross? So what you feel is typically the main string. So you're going to okay. get more feel from the main string. So if you put gut in the mains, it's going to be a much livelier feel than if you put uh, a loo in the mains and gut in the cross. Okay. But... Gut is the, the best string as far as absorbing shock and vibration. So it's the best string for your arm. Um, I think if you put, well, I know, if you put gut in the mains and then a poly in the cross, the gut will slide on the, the poly and you'll be able to generate more spin because it slides and snaps back better. Whereas if you flip it, if you have the poly in the mains, it kind of sticks to the gut. So you can't generate as much spin. So that kind of goes back to the... I'm guessing it would peel off too, the, the gut peels then, no? A little like if bit. The, if it actually, the... I mean, in the it's the coatings now are so much better than they used to be. Okay. I mean, it's especially Babolat gut. Babolat gut is, is, is by far my, the best in my opinion. I think the Luxalon gut is good, but the Luxalon is a little bit firmer. So it's more of like the guys that like the feel of the, the poly. Mm -hmm. So... Um, but yeah, I think the coatings are so much better that you don't really have to worry about them breaking as quick as they used to. You can play on a humid day. It's well, the one time we did have issues with with gut breaking was the first year we did the French, it was the COVID year, and it rained. It was a, like a steady mist all day every day. So the players that were playing with um, seventeen gauge gut were it was exploding. Really? Because it gets in wet. When you all talk the time. about like bad experiences, I had. Um, <laughs> Drop some a, names for me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, there's a girl. 
um, who was playing gut mains polycross and she played 17 gauge gut um, and she was up on Burton's a set and a break and broke all the strings. <laughs> broke all the strings? Had to f- play with their coach's racket. She finished the match with their coach's racket. That happened to me two days ago. Yeah. Justin was playing with the pro stuff. Two what? days ago. I played yeah. two games with a with a pro stuff. Wow. Yeah. And I hit four balls to the fence and I could not find the court. <laughs> <laughs> I could not find the court. Yeah. Well, I had to deal with her crying after the match. Wow. Going. She thought At like, the French, one of them she went. I'm guessing she was blaming you or no? No. So so what happens first round, she strings all the rackets. She goes out and you play. She wins, right? And then I think it was second round and she didn't do any rackets. And I'm like, okay, so I guess she's good. And all of a sudden there's four of them in the room at once because they all broke. And she went into her bag and one was broken. So she thought maybe someone like... When she didn't no have way. her bag, like cut her strings, she was like, she was all over the place. And and unfortunately, like, it was one of those experiences where like, she was, you know, about to win the match of her life, right? And mm-hmm. then all this happens and she ends up losing and she's standing there talking to me crying. Um, so that was, that was one of the, rough, yeah. the worst experiences wow. so I've had. Same day stringing yeah. overrated, but before you play a match, you just string your rackets. You know, and well, I guess she wouldn't have known. Like the rackets are breaking. Like I'm guessing you yeah, said and, it's and, breaking and in her bag too. If it you're was or something. something that's never happened to her before. Fair She's enough. never had that issue. And and really, like the French was that first year because it was in October. It rained every day, and it was like, I mean, Dimitrov was having issues. He had to switch to 16 gauge gut. Like he broke strings like that in Brisbane or somewhere. Yeah, it was another this event. year in January. I think somewhere, but he broke like four rackets in like a, like an hour. Yeah. Yeah. And he was freaking out like what's going on yeah yeah, yeah. so um it does affect the way it plays and like if that she was playing gut in the crosses it might not have happened mm-hmm. but you know and she ended up switching to full poly now so i was always curious like why murray played with gut in the cross and then federer and Djokovic played with it in the main i think it's it's more of the feel yeah like if you put gut in the mains it's going to feel livelier it's going to have more of a crisp feel if it's like Babylon like gut. Mm-hmm. The Lux gut will feel a little bit more like the poly. But um, if you put the poly in the mains, you get the, the poly feel more than anything. Okay. Um, I have a question. So for, let's say, tennis people who are not that serious and they, they keep rackets for a long time. Yeah. Cutting strings out, is there a proper way to do it? Because I've seen yeah. this girl, she posted a video where it's like, you should cut the main, then the cross, and the main, the cross to keep the racket from deforming is that it like what are, yeah. what are the best practices for cutting those strings and keeping the racket alive what's a can? politically correct question to ask what are best practices the guys went Wilson top and, and bonus bro I think because he's a serious guy you know yeah. <laughs> there's actually uh, the USRSA recommends you start in the middle like you snip the strings in the middle and then you go each string out like this mm-hmm. uh, we typically will go from the bottom to like halfway and then cut the crosses because we have cutters that you can cut them pretty quick and okay. then the cross and then finish the top. We used to do at tournaments, we used to just go from the bottom all the way up and then across. But then like Serena's rackets, if you did that, if you cut the the mains or the, I guess the cross, the racket would do this. And it was like, you could see how flexible her racket was just by cutting the strings out. So we're like, okay, maybe we need to stop here and then <laughs> cut the cross and then go up. Wow. But, yeah, so... So is that a common practice for all the stringers now to go like this... Sh- and then. I think most most tournament stringers just because you're, you're trying to get it done quick. I think it's better for the racket and and also like we're most players we're dealing with their 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 rackets are in good condition. You know, there's it's not a racket that's been sitting in the the garage for six months or a mm. year or whatever. Um, but I think the standard practice is like starting in the middle and kind of working your way out. Or another one I think was starting in a corner going diagonal up because then you're kind of releasing the pressure evenly. I've never heard that one before. Yeah. I've never even heard. Yeah. But then that one's... <laughs> I blanked. I blanked. When he, and I just, I that would yes, never, never cross my mind to cut out the strings. It take too long. Yeah. And then you're pushing out long ones on the other I side. I always go nail clipper yeah. from the middle this way, this way, and then just this way. So if you're using something like that, you should go around like that. You should do like the top, bottom, and then kind of go in a circle Bro. versus going... But I've got I've got some good cutters. You need to get some good cutters. You can just okay. cut them all the way up. Sounds good. Maybe yeah. I do. Um, have you? Sorry, you gonna ask something? Yeah, but I'm not. Sure. I, it's, I can just go wherever. Yeah, with it. it's fine. So, what are some of the extremes intentions? So, like on tour, 
I don't know if there's like a trend. I know back in the day, they used to stream, stream pretty tight, and I'm sure yeah. they're looser these days. But who is, let's say, on the higher spectrum and the lower spectrum today on tour on the men's and women's side? Uh, so on the men's side, the lowest is Manorino. I heard He's this always way. like 10 kilos. How many so, pounds is that? It's like 22 pounds. I don't believe this, though. How can he How can he control a tennis ball? Yeah, but I mean, if you look at his stroke, it's like he just finesses everything anyway. That's unbelievable. He's not like, 22 pounds is crazy. Yeah, and sometimes he's even lower. And Kokushkin is kind of... <laughs> in, in what a, situation does he have to drop? Yeah. Uh, 20, 22? Yeah. I think it's too high. Yeah, and then... <laughs> wow. Um, Kokushkin's kind of in that range, too. He's usually a little bit higher than that, but he's another one. But he plays 18-20, and, you know, it's in a, in a racket that... But if you watch him swing, you would never guess he's stringing that loose. Yeah. Because he's taking full cuts. cuts at the ball. Have you ever swung for Daniel Nesta? Yeah. Because Taylor, Taylor Dent, our, our previous coach, yeah. used to say that he would go to the tournament and ask the stringer, is this true? Yeah. He would ask the stringer, I've, who's, I've the, who's, it, yeah. who's the lowest this week? Yeah. Go one pound lower. Yeah. <laughs> no way. Yeah. That's a true story. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No yeah, way. Because I was in Miami when he walks up and he says that. And I'm, and I'm standing right behind the guy at the desk. And the uh -huh. guy is like, uh, I think it's uh, Jack Saki's at 35 pounds. He goes, okay, let's do one. Jack Sock was at 35 pounds. Yeah. And then he said, let's go 34. Yeah. The guy's nuts. So the thing is, I string at 54, and I feel like if I play for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, the strings are just crazy loose. Like they're just gonna. How? how Could you, you probably tie knots horribly? <laughs> but, how, <laughs> but, but how, how, like, when they start at 30 pounds, they have good stringers. But. On the other side of that too, if you start off that low, it's not going to lose as much. It doesn't have. The, it's not as far to, as far to go. Yeah, you know? it's already there. <laughs> yeah, and it's wow. not stretched as much too. So I don't think it's going to okay. lose as much. Okay, okay. Um, and I think what most people don't realize, like the difference between like if you did a racket at fifty and then one at forty, and if you really like got used to it and 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 felt the difference after you played with it for a little while and got used to it, I think you're only getting a little bit more depth on your shots. Yeah. You're not getting, like, the ball's not going to, I mean, of course, if you hit off center, if you hit a bad shot, it's going to fly no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. But if you're hitting the ball good and hitting the ball clean, you're just going to get probably another six or seven feet of depth. Okay. Maybe not even that. I think it's it's more of like a couple feet of depth you're going to get by dropping about 10 pounds. So minor, But it's just yeah. so hard, like, we talk about, feel and sound right like it's going to feel a little different and it's going to sound different yeah and pro players are so used to playing with whatever they've been playing with for so long they're used to hearing a certain sound and if it's different you're, it's not going to be right what's my name sound boing yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's terrible yeah. that's, and that's like i remember xavier malice malice he played with the same string his entire career sick player yeah and, and towards the end I mean, we were talking to his coach i think it was in dc one year at a tournament and He's like, yeah, he goes, he, he could get Babolat gut for free and he could play, get RPM for free. And he played with it and he goes, it was amazing. Like he was hitting the ball so well, but he couldn't get used to the sound. It sounded different. Wow. What was he using? Um, he was using, what was it? Uh, Fiber Tour, like a Babolat, really cheap, like multi-filament string. Mm -hmm. Had like a pearl coating. Okay. And he had to buy it from him. And because they, they didn't make it anymore, so he would have to buy it. He would have to buy like 500 sets because they weren't going to make it except for him. Yeah. So he was paying for it. Could have switched strings to a better string for free, but he couldn't get used to the wow. sound. That's interesting. Yeah. Have you noticed also as time has gone on with like rackets and I guess technology and string and stuff, has weights changed? Like swing weights and like. Like how people want their rackets customized, has that changed over the years? You know, I think, I think it has. I think there's, I think the the old school mentality has been like super heavy. And I mean, if you talk like Pete Sampras and those guys, like extremely heavy rackets, but the strokes were a lot flatter too. There wasn't as many players that were trying to hit like Nadal. Like much more linear. Yeah. yeah. And if you, if you have a lot of mass and you get it moving forward, it's just going to keep going. You're going to be able to hit a big ball. And not have to put a lot of effort into it as long as you get it moving forward. Um, but guys that are trying to do like this and they're trying to whip up on the ball, if you have a lot of right weight in the head, it's hard to do that. So I think that's probably been a big change. Um, one of the things I've noticed uh, in the last couple years, actually probably the last year, year and a half, is guys are going back to more of like 18, 20 rackets. 
Whereas there was a, a trend probably five or six years ago, everyone was playing like a pure drive, an arrow, a 1619 blade. Everything was like either really wide open patterns. Whereas when I first started in 2009, everything was 1820. Like everything was. Mm -hmm. No one was playing with anything 1619 except for like Roddick. You, you know? think that could be because of the strings? Like the strings are getting better, like more powerful. So guys just want to control the ball more. I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. I don't know. I think it kind of goes in phases, right? Like everyone play, tries the pure drive and, and is like, I can get so much power with this and then you can get so much spin. Um, and then the I don't grass know. is green on the other side. You want some more control. Yeah. 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 And then <laughs> someone, but I think, I think it matters how you play. Like, you know, someone like Alcaraz or Nadal or some of these guys that are hitting a ton of spin, a more open pattern seems to help. Um, and even them, it's, they're using like the 1620 now where they're getting kind of a little bit more. See, I always thought it was the opposite way around. I thought if someone has so much spin already, they need 1820 to try and control the ball. Yeah. Which I is mean, why I think like, I guess by your theory, it makes sense why Justin likes this racket so much. The racket he's using now. Like, I think this is for as long as I've seen Justin play, I think this racket has, it looks the best, like when he hits the ball. Yeah. And it probably, it's 1619, no? Like it complements what he already does well. 1619 yeah. is thicker and it's like a rounder yeah. shape. It's, and not, in the past, it's 98, I'll, but it's, it in looks In the past, bigger. I would say, yeah. I would never say to use that racket. You know, I'd be like, that's yeah, a horrible would, racket. It's like, Justin hits the ball either. so yeah. hard, give him a control racket. Yeah. But then now he's just like, yeah. it looks, it looks good. You know? Yeah. It plays a little easier for me. I don't know. I don't, yeah. I don't feel like I need to like, you know, destroy yeah. the ball. It yeah. kind of just goes on its own. Yeah. Have you ever tested Nadal's specs? Because I've I've heard people talk about how light the racket is. And I've heard other people say it's like tip weighted and it's not that light. Do you? So I have. And when I did, the swing was pretty high. I think it was like 360. Okay, so he's got um, this man's racket. But I think he's also one of those that's probably tweaked things. I know like mm. he always played RPM 135 that's forever. Like, and, and I mean, with as much spin as is he Is there got, a thicker string than that? No. One, uh, three, I mean, five. There are like, I think Luxalon, when Wilson had the spin rackets where they had like mm -hmm. 14 mains and 16 crosses or whatever it was, 16, you know, <laughs> like when they had those rackets, they made, came out with like a one for one. And then Mark Woodford played Play with, with rope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think it was Woodford played with uh, one, six, one, but his racket was like 10 mains and 12 crosses. Oh, wow. But his rack, his string was really thick. It was a special made Luxalon string. Okay. But, um, yeah. So so his swing weights are 360. Roughly. Yeah. And is and the I, grip that small? Is it small? Yeah. His is a 3 8. Oh, people he, I he, thought he, it was he, keep saying yeah. 4 and a quarter. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think you know, he but I think he's also like when he used to use 135, he switched to 130 for a little while and now he's back. Last time I saw him, he was using 135 again. Mm -hmm. But I think he's probably experimented a little bit more over the years where I don't know if his racket's still super heavy. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe he's dropped that um he's probably gone back and forth between grip sizes at, at some point i would think yeah. but um I, i'm almost positive it was a grip size three but again i could be wrong and so sure. to go back to we were talking about the extremes and, and string tensions you yeah. said manorino's on the yeah. low side and who who would be on the on the high side dustin brown was really dustin high dustin brown was always really high um the actually the highest one is um i can never pronounce her name right it's she's a doubles player it's erike or erike um, she wants us to string it as tight as the machine goes. Which is what? what? Yeah. Which is what? 88. Ooh. 88? Her rounds? rounds don't snap? She wants it 90. Like, that's what she comes in and asks for 90. Well, like, it only goes to 88. And I think we can get it, sometimes we can get... What like, does she play with? What racket does she use? <laughs> she plays an ultra. So a powerful racket. Okay. Kind of like what you're playing with now. 88 pounds? Yeah. That's wood. And she plays 4G, which is a, a string that holds tension. And it's, it's a pretty stiff string. <laughs> She's like, serious about it. <laughs> oh, and, and I mean, you would never... She strings watch once it. a year. <laughs> yeah, she does She does every tournament. She does rackets for every match. Like she does... I mean, she's not a huge stringer, but she's usually doing a racket a match. Her doubles. And um, But yeah, she always wants it as tight as the machine goes. Wow. What's yeah. about the difference in surfaces? So for example And altitudes, please. So yeah. yeah. So yeah. so it's Australia and Alcaraz drops off his racket and the tension is there versus it's Wimbledon and it's on grass versus Or it's, it's the French on the cold day. Yeah. yeah. So how how much different tension would they fluctuate? Do you know? Yeah, that's that's funny too. I have a, a funny story about uh Australian Open one year where we're uh 
we, you know, we're all on the string and over. There's a coach that was uh, talking about, he was doing a, an Australian Open, like one of for their website or something. And he's like, these guys will go up as much as 10 kilos when it gets hot. And we're all like, did he really just say 10 kilos? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, and he could have easily asked, like, that's the other thing. Like, sometimes you have coaches that are really good and knowledgeable. And sometimes you have coaches that think they know everything. He mm. could have turned around and asked anyone in the room. Yeah. So what are guys doing when it gets hot? Is it, are they well, going up the kitchen? Everything. But he knows, right? <laughs> like then there's, you know, there's a lot of coaches that their ego is so Would you big. like to tell us the name of that coach? No. <laughs> we'll bleep it. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. I, I think I would go up like in altitude, for example, if it's like severe altitude, I go up maybe four pounds, five pounds. Yeah. I think what I see at, Max. at, at tournaments, which is... You know, and, and what we see typically is, you know, not, the altitude is not changing, the surface isn't changing, but we see like the temperature changes. Yeah. If it gets really hot, if it goes up like an extra 10 degrees, some guys will go up maybe one or two pounds. Exactly. Um, if it goes down, if it gets cooler one day, like in Australia, we had a lot of extra string jobs because the temperature changed so much there. Um, it doesn't change as much in New York or, or Paris, but it does a little bit. Um, but yeah, typically they'll go up a couple pounds or, or down a couple pounds if it's hot or cold. Are there guys who don't care and they just stick to the same? The doll is 25, 25 kilos every time, everywhere. Uh, and everywhere, like in altitude, everything doesn't matter. No, he doesn't, he doesn't change anything. Um, but then there is, there was a, a little bit of a time frame there where we went to 25 and a half. Okay. which is one pound <laughs> so he went from 55 to 50, 56 pounds the reason was or just he was doing he just, he he got, was no, no, just changed them i don't know have you ever tried that like in like you're at a tournament and tomorrow's gonna be hotter or tomorrow's gonna be cold and you change the temperature because i like it in theory like i can like it makes sense to me and i can feel the difference but i never thought to check the weather to no, see like what tomorrow's I, gonna be i feel like once i get to a tournament and i find attention that works for me at a tournament i just stay with it but I have had where I've like played a day that was cold and then played on a hot day and I'm yeah, like, yeah. shoot, the ball is flying. Exactly. Yeah. I've had that feeling. But what's hard is that like if you didn't have the machine stringing on your own, like you don't know who's going to string on a day. It's not like the US Open where they're calculated yeah. with the string. Like, yeah. You don't know the machine. You don't know who's going to string. That sucks when there's you like don't know a couple of strings and knots. they just don't care and they everybody's <laughs> yeah, everybody's just doing them. Everybody got on finger tape just yeah it's crazy <laughs> well and okay. sometimes though when it's it gets cool like you've got stuff in your bag from the day before that may even be better you know so i i've noticed that too at That's tournaments true. when it does get cooler like if it's it, the temperature drops for a couple days like guys aren't stringing as much because they've got stuff yeah in bag the used already... string feels better when it's cold yeah yeah so um and then like uh going back to like pro players like alcaraz at the U.S. Open and the French, because uh, I know his, his private stringer, he's always 25, 23. At Rolling, or I'm sorry, at Labor Cup, he was 24, 22. The first okay. couple ones he did, he was 25, 23, and then he started going 24, 22. But it's indoors, a little bit cooler than than normal, so that that makes sense. What is his um, like specs? You know, his right. I, I don't know. Uh, I think he's. I think he's in that like 330 swing weight range, but not strong. Not, yeah. Not really? Not, not heavy. crazy. Not crazy heavy, no. And um, the last time you saw Roger Federer, did you get the chance to test the, the racket or no? No, I've, I haven't tested it. I know like I've felt the rackets, they, they're, they're heavy. Okay. For sure. But if, it, it kind of makes sense with his stroke too. Yeah. Um, Heavier than the dog at 360? Or around a similar. I think it's. It's different. I think his is more solid all the way through. Okay. You know what I mean? Like there's more like I think Nadal's weight's more at the tip. It's and tip, the, and his is more just like the static. The whole yeah, thing is heavy. His whole thing is like just just heavier. Uh, Novak. Novak's is pretty heavy too. Okay. Yeah. You want to go down the list anymore? Zverev. I mean, I can't be curious about about <laughs> the greatest of all playing. time specs. You know what? You know what I was just thinking about is. Okay, let's say I string at fifty four normally. Okay. I go, like, for example, I was just in France. Mm -hmm. And I know that the indoors are fast in France. Mm -hmm. So I would think, okay, maybe I want a little bit more control or something on a fast indoor court. Okay. But the indoors are cold. So... It maybe evens up. Do I go down? Do I go up? Do I stay the maybe same? just stay right where you are. Is that why I lost first round? What did you do? <laughs> I think I stayed the same. I, I don't remember what I did. 
I don't remember what I did. But it just, I didn't think, I, it would always, I never process temperature to change the temp. Like it makes sense because I know on a hot day I would feel it. Or like if I'm in the cold and I'm using a used string, it feels better than if I strung one fresh on a cold day because I never adjusted for the cold. I never adjusted to go loose on a cold day. But we're learning. I'm yeah. coming to feel we're like pause, that everything <laughs> to do with performance is like, it's overrated if you think it is, and it's underrated if you think it is. It's like if you care so much about the string. That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not saying you in general, but like, besides yeah. when when your strings yeah. actually pop, if you like something, just do that. Don't worry so much about like <laughs> what's correct and what everybody else is doing. Like you I gotta kind of know why, yourself and just kind of. I think that's why Taylor, go with what you like. I think that's why Taylor like. It's like what he, how you describe in Nadal to be like. Taylor told me that he never changed his tension, mm -hmm. and I remember Taylor was always against us like fiddling with like specs and string and whatever. He was like, just use this. Like Bro, he told me to switch this. to the Aero Pro drive and string at forty eight pounds. Taylor told you to do that. Yeah, he said you should play like that. Maybe you should have listened. Yeah, right. Because now you're using, <laughs> now you're using the, the, say equivalent, sorry. the equivalent of the. Say of sorry that. to him. <laughs> T. Dunn, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Like, how does one join Lux Salon stringing team or with a string? Uh, like, yeah. is it like you go, you go to like a stringing tournament and, then, <laughs> and you have to string at a certain amount of time? It has to yeah. be in a certain amount of tension. quality and you have to know Dustin. Wow. But like, no, I mean, like, how did you, let's say, qualify yeah. for this team? Like, how does so, that even work? So I got lucky because um, you guys know I'm from like Keller, Texas, where I mm. lived forever before moving here. Um, and there was a, a group called Grand Slam Stringers which is run by a guy named Ten Strawn. And uh, he had a symposium. And the first symposium was at Nukes. Um, no, actually T-Bar-M in, in New, New, uh, New Braunfels. So it was like two and a half hours from where I live. So I went to that and I knew Ron Rocky who runs the Wilson Stringing team. I knew he was gonna be there. So that was my whole goal of going is, is getting him to, to watch me string or find out what I need to do to get on the team. Um, cause I, and this is like 2007, 2008, I think. And I'd already done some tournaments. Um, and it worked out to where I was rooming with a guy who was from, uh, Mansfield and we, he was a stringer too, but he was, you know, he doesn't string anymore. I don't think, well, I think he does at home, but he's not like a tournament string or anything. But anyway, it worked out where we went to the, the thing we roomed together because it was cheaper and Ron rode with us to dinner the first night. And on the way home from dinner, I said, I really want to get on the team. Is there any way you can watch me string a racket? He's like, yeah, maybe we can work out something. So at the end of the, the conference, we went through all the, the symposium, all the, it was a, you know, a lot of people in the industry that were, you know, very knowledgeable, um, good information for someone learning how to string, which I wish they still had something like that. But anyway, um, at the end, he watched me string a racket. I strung the racket. Didn't even straighten the string, just hand him the racket. And he was like, he told me all the reasons why I wasn't good enough to be on the Wilson team. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, all right. I was doing a pro tournament like the next week. And I'm like, I thought I was pretty good at what I'm doing, but evidently I'm not. Okay. Um, so the next year it was in uh, Saddlebrook, I think. No, it was in Orlando the next year. And then they moved to Saddlebrook for every year after that. But anyway, so the next year they had a tour simulation room where basically they, they simulated what it was like to string at a pro tournament. Um, so stringers to kind of get the experience of what it would be like. And um, there uh, I had two other guys that were helping me at another tournament that were also there. So he was like, all right, we're going to run this like you're managing them or you're the lead stringer and they're helping you get everything done. So we're going to do that. And then at one point where uh, someone asked me a question, I turned around and one of the guys running it snipped my string. And I'm like, oh, great. So it was just kind of like, you know, that happens at tournaments. Sometimes a string breaks or something pops on the machine. You got to figure out a way to get all your rackets done on time. But anyway, so we uh, get through that. And he's like, all right, I think with the training, you may be ready. So that was, I think, 2008, 2009. I went to Miami, trained with Yat Kong, who was the guy that I was telling you that trained uh, Roman Prokes okay. um, and a lot of good guys in the industry. But um now it's it's a little bit different process because there isn't that avenue. We actually got probably four, four or five guys on the team that went through that symposium, which was basically just a big seminar with stringers doing presentations mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, 
now it's, uh, you know, we kind of, we've got 22 guys. Well, we probably have, I think probably 26 or 27. And I always say guys, but we have some, some very good female stringers on the team too. Uh, so That's I got to stop saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Only guys watch this channel. So yeah, we're 98%. They're <laughs> yeah, not going to get yeah. canceled over here. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so now it's, we have a kind of a network, right? So if one of our guys does the Australian and they're like, oh, we had, I worked with this guy and he was really good. You know, we can mm. put him through training and it's, our training's evolved over the years where we have a guy that, uh, named Joe Height who does all the training with us. And I'll help him with it. But, you know, for what we've learned, I started helping him with training probably five or six years ago. And what we've learned is it's not about how good you are as a stringer. Um, That's obviously a factor, but it's how you fit on the team. You know, Mm -hmm. when you have 20 plus of some of the best stringers in the world from all over the world, some of them have bigger egos than others. Um, It's... You know, it's not always easy to find people that fit. Um, so now it's, we, we actually expanded our training to four days. So we're around them for two extra days. We used to just do two days and then you do a test. And if you're good enough, you, you get a chance to come maybe the next tournament. Mm-hmm. Um, now we've expanded to four days. So we spend a lot more time with these people and we kind of, we see how they work with each other. We, we put them in situations where we're, we're looking to see if they have teamwork and they work together or how they you know, help each other. That's got to be a bigger thing because I guess the string in itself is pretty standardized. Like you guys have, I'm assuming all of the stringers, they're going to string the same way, you know, like tie the knots the same way. Like, yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, there is something too, like the fact that there's a lot of people that think they can do it and then they show up to a tournament and they have to string 30 rackets and they're like, I don't ever want to do this again. You know, they, you know, we get asked all the time, oh, you watch any tennis? I'm like, yeah, on the TV in the stringing room. That's mm-hmm. what I watch. I didn't go sit and watch yeah. matches. And Because by the time you're at the end of the day, like, I mean, you guys know what it's like. You've been to tournaments. You've seen stringers when you show up. There's, they're probably there 7, 38 in the morning. And they're there when you leave at night, too. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's some true. of those smaller events, you're, you're, you got to be there till the last <clears> ball is hit. <throat> Luckily, at the slams, we rotate it to where I have two people stay every night. Um, so two people stay till sometimes one o'clock, two, three in the morning, but then they can come in later the next day. Whereas at a smaller event, it's just, you know, two guys there. You got to be there till everything's done. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, so, but now it's, we try to make sure that everyone fits, uh, in on the team and then we can help them be better stringers. We can make them good enough as long as they're at a certain level, Yeah, you know, like, you can't take someone that's never strung a racket and, and get them to the, the tour level quick. It's it takes time. But um, most stringers that are that have been doing it for a long time that are willing to adapt and do it the way we want them to do it, they they have a chance of making the team. How fast can you string a racket? Like fastest you've ever strung a racket? Fastest I've ever done was probably like in the ten minute range. I know. How what was it? The pattern? Does 16, it matter? It does ten matter. minutes? If it was if it was a ten twelve, I'd be he like, said ah, ten yeah. minute range. Yeah. Well, that was. But it so depends. Bro. That was in Australia, and and that was Nadal sent two rackets. And you strung a rougher racket in ten minutes. Yeah. You Brave. better you, you better not have missed any. <laughs> <Brave>. <laughs> yeah. But that one was. We had a guy that always strings his rackets mm-hmm. at at that at that time. He was every tournament he did. He was stringing them, and then COVID happened and. He's Australian, so he couldn't come to the U.S. and um, for a few years. But anyway, he he was consistently doing them in like the ten minute range, like from Whoa. beginning to end. And that was like the racket comes in the room, they were out of the room in probably twelve minutes back to the court. Well, yeah. So and I beat him. He, I mean, he, <laughs> <laughs> that was you know that was probably the fastest one I've ever done in my life. And you know, usually when people ask me that question, the answer is it depends on how fast I need to string the racket. Okay. Because it's generally 15, 20 minutes. If I need to get it done in 12 minutes, I can do most rackets in 12 minutes mm-hmm. if I had to. But, you know, I try. You, you can't maintain that pace. Like, and that's the thing that's that's hard about doing tournaments. You know? Get some other one. There's no testing on the stringing team. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Okay, should we run the game? Oh, actually, do we do the Already? questions first? Hold on, some questions. So, Dustin. We asked Instagram some questions. This one is from Adrian. He said, I'm customizing my rackets on my own with a scale and a 
Graffiti? Yeah. Is that the name of the, the machine? Yeah, it's like the equivalent of that for customization. Okay. Yeah. So it's a great machine then. Um, he said, it's working well, but I find myself getting different numbers every time because of my scale. Do you have any recommendations for a reliable 0.1 gram or 0.01 gram scale that's not too big and expensive? Yeah, that's um, a good scale. Like as far as measuring static weight is very important. Um, I use, it's called my way and I think it's the I 500. Uh, and, and I, just, when I saw the question, I looked at it up and it's, um, I think it's like $75, $76 on, on Amazon. And I, I bought mine. Mine's like the old version. I bought mine probably like 2006 or seven and it still works good. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. So let's go to the next question. This is also from Adrian. Do you have any tips for not having completely different swing weights on your rackets without getting an actual machine to measure it? I mean, so he should be able to with that Braviti machine because that Braviti is a uh, measure swing weight. So he should be able to get a uh, consistent reading. Uh, again, I've never used it, but I've heard, I know like one pro player that uses it. She uses this and the Braviti, I think too. Okay. Yeah. But, um, I think it's somewhat consistent. So the hard part is like a, a lot of it's trial and error, right? So when you first start customizing, um, and I've seen some people use like, like the putty that you use to hang stuff on the walls, like, cause that's got some mass to it. You can kind of stick it in one spot and say, okay, this is, if I put weight here, this is what it's going to do to the swing weight. Or if I put it to the tip. So, you know, unfortunately, like it's a lot of trial and error, but that can kind of help speed things up for someone that's trying to figure out where to add the weight to get a, a consistent swing weight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question is from Nesta. How can I customize my racket in order to improve pain in my wrist, arm, or shoulder? Yeah, that's the the thing we kind of went back to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and typically that's that's the right answer, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is technique. Yeah. Um, and can, there's there's a lot of factors, right? If you're using a stiff racket mm -hmm. that's really light, and then if you have a really stiff string strung really tight. And then you have a bad technique on your forehand, you're gonna have arm pain no matter what. That's no an arm pain. That's an arm pain solid. So I guess yeah. you can you can like eliminate things. You know, yeah. it depends on what you want to eliminate first. Yeah, if you want sure. to elim yeah. eliminate the bad technique first, you I can guess you're talking about wrist pain. Maybe check the grip size too. Maybe it's too small. Yeah, I mean, there's so many factors. I think. How do you measure the correct size? I've heard people say something about a finger. Yeah. Like how? Like what's the rule i mean general it's, rule. it's so subjective but that's kind of the general rule if you hold the the racket demonstrate you know, like your forehand yeah and then you should have so like if you hold you know let's say continental grip right yeah you should have about a finger's width uh -huh. here and not if you're like gripping it really tight, tight but you yes. like if it's comfortable and you want something that's like i would play i play with this is a grip size three yeah so I play... You customize it. You should know. <laughs> I have it in my, my spreadsheet. <laughs> but um, typically, like, I usually like in between a three and a four. So I like one that's, like, not quite a grip size 3. four. 5. So, like, I, I, what I used to play with forever was grip size four with a thin base grip. Mm. So then it was a little bit less than a grip size four. Um, but I've, I've gotten lazy, so I just started using three eights. But mm. um, I think... A grip size four is better for my wrist because I'm not having to do as much. Um, but, you know, a grip size three or a grip size four is probably interchangeable for me. Mm -hmm. Whereas some people, it's depending on the size of their hand, okay. it's definitely a factor. Okay. But, and I've, I've worked with, um, at a club I worked at in Dallas, there was a chiropractor there and he swore up and down about going up a grip size helped a lot of his clients mm -hmm. going up mm -hmm. okay because yeah. most of them are playing with too small yeah and they're squeezing on yeah. yeah and if you watch like it's you know a lot of people are, like walking around with the racket like they're they're like gripping it somebody. so yeah. tight <laughs> that it's just like okay relax put it in your other hand for a minute <laughs> but, the artifice <laughs> but i think for for like this guy i think switching to gut or a gut hybrid is going to help with the arm, whatever is it, wrist or arm? Did he say? It said all of it. Yeah. Yeah. It said Everything. wrist, elbow, shoulder, starting yeah. at the forehand, Neck. going right down. No, I'm just yeah. kidding. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Stop but, ripping on Nesta. I don't know Nesta, bro, but, but thanks, I think thanks that, for watching. 
a, you know, a hybrid or, or even full gut is going to be better for his arm. And then maybe adding some silicone in the handle, checking the grip size, like you said, to make sure it's right. Mm -hmm. And then... I mean, know. that's something we did. That's something I did in my racket. Like, I remember we talked about the like small elbow pain that I had and right. show like over the years, there've been times where I've like messed around with different strings or now I have silicone in the handle for that reason. Yeah. What's about the shock absorbers? How important are those? They, they absorb a little bit of string vibration. They don't really absorb racket vibration. And I think, I mean, obviously everything is a factor, but I think 99% of it is racket vibration is what's going to hurt your arm. Okay. The, the string vibration I don't think it's does. a myth. I don't think it does very much. It's a feel thing, maybe. To me, it, it and is. sound. Like, it sounds. Sound, it yeah. sounds like yeah. instead yeah. of ding. Yeah, and 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 a lot of pro players don't use them because they like the extra feedback. Oh, sorry, <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> uh, but they like the extra feedback from the the extra vibration mm -hmm. or the sound, whatever it is. Um, but I've always liked. The way a vibration dampener felt, or I used I used to use rubber bands all the time. Mm -hmm. I use rubber bands now. Yeah. I don't know why, but use the Pete Sampras. Oh, yeah, good one. But I always felt like it it changed the feel a little bit. Like it made it feel to me. It felt like when I would use a rubber band that the strings felt a little bit tighter, but it's more how it felt. Yeah. It. What the hell is Gasquet doing with his grip? Oh, so when he has the thick. Yeah. What what does that so, do? For what, so whenever what? I um oh sorry. You good? I one time I had his racket right, and I saw like there was like a cut right here. Like uh -huh. it's you could see like it's very high up on the grip. I'm like, what is that? And then I realized he had a full leather grip to here, mm -hmm. and then it was cut, and then another full leather uh. grip to finish the racket. Because it's it's literally like it's like it's it's huge. What's the effect of that? I never understood. I think he holds like off the, the handle like this. Uh -huh. So I think he feels like he gets more. Yeah, whip or something. Yeah. I don't it's know. crazy. But, but yeah, even on his backhand, I don't know how he yeah, gets the backhand. It's unbelievable. Like yeah. It's absurd. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like it gets thicker every year because the, the grip gets shorter and shorter. Like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He can't, grip, he can't even really get the, the turning grip all the way around it either. It's like kind of hanging off the side. It's a new one. Every, every changeover does, does, does a grip. You know that? Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, all right, let's run the game, Justin. You have the all questions. Right. So we play a game on this podcast where we mix <clears throat> tennis trivia with random stuff. Right. Math, Please. science, really quickly, whatever. Really quickly. He has if, been if, on a winning streak. If you ask a mathematics question, I'm not answering. That's your business. It could be one plus one. That's I'm your just business. Gonna concede the point. That's your business. Okay. <laughs> I don't care. So you know how many it's people? First, it's first to three correct answers. You're embarrassing me on the internet. <laughs> We're good friends. It's okay. It was, it's first. You tried to match me earlier, remember? Um, first to three correct answers. You just shout it out. If you shout it out and you get it wrong, He's a chance to answer. Okay. And then you have a second chance to answer. And if you get it wrong twice, we move on to the next question. All right. First of three correct answers is the winner. Question number one. How many ounces in one pound? How many ounces is equal to one pound? 16? Yes. I guess I know that. I feel like... Did you know that? You just didn't know the game? Or you were thinking... Yeah, no. I, I, I thought that that was right, but... I wasn't hundred percent sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna guess twelve. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Bro, you're making it it's bad, only one zero. It's only one zero. All right. How many Masters One Thousand events are there in the United States? Three. Well done. Yeah. Which and they are. Three. Name that for me. In your world, Cincinnati, Miami. Well done. Come on now. <laughs> Come on now. Hey, I'm on a roll. 1-1. One, 1-1. One, one, one. What is the capital city of Florida? The capital city of Florida. Miami? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. That's not, that was a guess. Tallahassee. Is Tallahassee? Yeah. I you to, can guess whenever you I want. I wanted to say Miami right? so bad. I wanted to say Miami <laughs> so bad. He did it. That's Why? unreal. That was just a guess. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> Did y'all know what it was? Y'all knew it was Miami? I mean, Tallahassee? 2-1, two, two, Dustin. All right, man. Man. Let's fight. Let's fight. I think I'm going to go math. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. 
Don't do it because I'm not going to answer. We'll just shake hands now and just, just you know. <laughs> but be a, be a good sport. Maybe you redeem yourself. No, no. I'm not good with math either. Let it go. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, I love that. All right. Who is the last player to win four Grand Slams in a row? On the men's side. I don't know about women's. Four slams in a row? Yes. Do, 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 Fed? Do. No. Only two more. Djokovic? Yes. It's Djokovic? Yes. That's you know, most, I was going to guess Djokovic and I thought he never, he didn't get the calendar slam. Not the calendar, but he won. Yeah, but that's, yeah. I figured like... 2015, six, Wimbledon... Straight through the 2016 French, I believe yeah. it was. Yeah. Wow, that's that long ago. Yeah. yeah. All right. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dustin, thanks for coming. If lastly, Dustin is in South Florida, but you, I guess you commute sometimes, not commute, but you travel back and forth to Texas sometimes. So yeah. if someone wanted to, you know, get some stringing done or get some customization done, how can they reach out to you um, or your company? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Because uh, <laughs> uh, I haven't really been very good at promoting my, myself here, especially here. But um, yeah, most people I, I, that I've been stringing for have people that I know Word have given my number. Yeah. You know? What's it called? What's the business called? It's called. It's yeah, that's, that's how it's <laughs> yeah. You can reach out to Dustin via Instagram on Mozi Tennis or you can reach out to us M-O-Z-I M-O-Z-I Tennis we're going to put it up on the screen and um, or you can reach out to us we made a bet that Dustin is going to get five clients from this episode okay I made a bet with and Nadal Vassal what's the payoff there's not oh there is a payoff actually what is it it's a a free string job a free for, string job for him yeah yeah or oh, yeah. he pays for an extra one <laughs> <laughs> So, if you're in South Florida and you need to get your rackets done, please hit up Dustin. Um, yeah, this was fun. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Really cool. Insightful. Right. Huh? So insightful. Insightful. Nice. Very insightful. All right. Thanks for watching, guys. See you in the next episode.